can I try a query? We'll, yeah. We'll over here. All right. Uh, can we do a 2019 Subaru Outback? Uh, why won't the passenger window entirely go up? Why does it get stuck halfway up and then make us want to scream? So there was actually like two TSBs that were related to issues with the power window for this model. Um, so this is at least a good starting point for diagnosing this, this particular problem. I'm not going to lie. That's impressive. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for limited time at vanta.com slash twist. Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And Calshi, the largest regulated predictions market, now lets you trade on U.S. elections. Visit Kelshi.com slash twist to see live election odds, place a trade, and get $20 when you deposit $100. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My name is Alex. I'm Alex over on X. You can also find me on LinkedIn pretty much anywhere around the web. But today I have good news. We have an excellent founder on the show, part of the launch family. Here we have someone with deep technology experience that seems to have taken a bit of a turn away from her original work and applying startup magic to an entirely different industry. So please welcome to the program. It's Linda Gray. Linda, how are you? Hi, Alex. I'm um, doing well. Just really thrilled to, to be on the program. And uh, yeah, um, thank you for all the support from, from launch. And it's been fantastic to help us, you know, kind of uh, get traction and accelerate our company. Awesome. And I just realized I didn't actually say your company's name out loud. So let me fix that. Mastertech.ai. And Linda, I really wanted to talk to you, not only because I like what you're working on, but you spent 15 years at Microsoft as a principal software engineering lead manager, other roles. You also worked at Niantic, um, at the Pokemon Go game. And, you know, I, I used to cover Microsoft. I know that company. I have known many people there. I'm a little surprised that you went from those two jobs into what MasterTech is building. So first of all, tell us the founding story. And I, I can't wait to hear how this came to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's definitely not a straight line. If you look at my career from Microsoft to Niantic, and that was a little bit of a pivot in of itself. And sure. then now to Master Tech AI, kind of building um, AI for mechanics, for uh, technicians, um, you know, frontline workers um, in these in these shops. Um, so yeah, so so my career, I uh, I pretty much joined Microsoft out of college. So you know, kind of r rose up through the ranks from intern when I first interned back in 2004. That was my first stint at Microsoft, and uh, uh, joined full time. Um, kind of uh, worked my way up up the chain to like I was principal engineer on the Outlook web team for a number of years. Uh, went into engineering leadership, engineering management. So I led teams at Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft Teams, mm -hmm. Xbox Live, and uh, built a lot of great software, a lot of great teams, and uh, learned a lot through that process. You know, I think for me, like, you know, after 15 years at Microsoft and, you know, 17 years in tech in general, it's like I, I really just didn't want to just do one thing, you know, in my life, right? And I was like, I, there's so much more that, I'm excited to do and, you know, and I think being in a large, larger tech company like Microsoft and Niantic, it offers you a lot of great opportunities to make such like large scale impact in the products that you work on. You know, the products that, you know, I'm used to serving like, you know, 200 million monthly active users, right? With kind of the, the office, uh, you know, set of users, Xbox, you know, Niantic, et cetera. But it is like hard to kind of really go do the true greenfield projects, the zero to one, like really build something new and innovative that, you know, big tech companies are not really going to necessarily want to take the risk to invest in. So that's, that's sort of what motivated me is like, I, I knew I wanted to eventually like really go do a startup, do a zero to one project. And, um, you know, and and with kind of the innovation that was happening in AI in the last couple of years, the technology shift, it was uh -huh. like a perfect time. It was really, you know, like that's what excites me as a technologist, as, you know, 
that's something that we can really apply in the real world and make real world impact. Yeah. And, um, but, but Linda, so all that tracks. Yeah. Technology experience, lots of time, different teams, different projects, want to go out there, want to go zero to one, go into something greenfield. But why did you pick, uh, you know, essentially auto shops, mechanics, and the care of cars as the place to apply AI? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so when I started looking into the space um, and looking at the potential problems that I wanted to solve with building a new product, building a new startup, you know, I was looking at sort of the gamut of, you know, the 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 problems that I had experienced, you know, in my career, the problems I was familiar with, as well as problems like outside in other domains. And for me personally, I I really didn't want to build the same set of uh, or solve the same set of problems that you know I always see being solved in in tech. It feels a lot like a tech bubble, you know, through all my experiences at Microsoft um, and uh, you know these larger larger tech companies. And I was like, if I do a startup, I don't want to be like you know the twentieth company that just solves another variant of this this particular problem. You know, I don't want to give specific examples, but it's a lot of like tech companies and engineers solving. Co- problems for other tech companies and engineers. And, ah. and I felt like there was this big rest of the world where there were so many industries in the real world that was underserved and um, overlooked, you know, and we can actually make such a bigger real world impact by bringing technology to these like underserved markets and actually have a bigger real world impact. So well, one thing, if I go back into my Microsoft reporting memory bank, and it's it's been a while since that was my you know core day job, but I recall one time talking to a Microsoft team, it may have actually been the team's team about how they were trying to bring the product out to more frontline workers. Yes. And if I think about frontline workers, people who are actually literally on the ground working on cars as they come into shops and so forth are about as frontline as you can get in the employment space. So is there any connection between the Microsoft frontline push and where you picked to build your startup? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I was on the the D to D platforms team on the apps ecosystem for Teams. So yeah, there was a lot of opportunities to integrate with third party apps on the on the developer platform, and you know to 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 work with frontline workers, like not directly but indirectly um, through it. serving them. But it was still you know very approaching problems in a very horizontal manner. And that's sort of what you have to do in big tech companies when you build like Outlook, when you build teams, it is sort of sometimes ends up being a least common denominator for what is kind of the platform that can enable sort of horizontal experiences. And um, I was more like, but it does end up being like a least common denominator experience for any particular, you know, set of problems. So I was more excited about like, hey, let's really just make the best freaking solution for this particular problem and use technology to its fullest. And that's what I was really excited about. Founders, do you want to sell to bigger customers? I know you do. You got to get that ACV trending up and you want to push your churn down, right? Sounds good. But to sell to those big buyers, you need to clear all of these compliance checks. You know that. That means you got to have things like SOC 2 sorted out. What's SOC 2? It's a standard and ensures that companies keep their customer data safe. And if you aren't SOC 2 compliant, you can kiss those big deals goodbye. You're not going to land the lighthouse customers. You're not going to be able to operate at the highest end of the market. But Vanta makes it really easy for you to get and renew your SOC 2 compliance on average. Vanta customers are compliant in just two to four weeks, can take months without Vanta, and they automate compliance for GDPR, HIPAA, and more. So you can sell to bigger customers in whatever markup your startup is going after. Vanta is going to save you hundreds of hours of work and up to 85% on compliance costs. Stop slowing your sales team down and use Vanta. Get $1,000 off at vanta.com slash twist. That's vanta.com slash twist for $1,000 off your SOC 2. Okay, so... I mean, like I've owned cars. Uh, I don't drive much anymore. My my spouse is a great driver, so she does it. But, uh, you know, we have to take care of our vehicles. We bring them into places, auto shops, dealerships, and so forth. Uh, I'm really curious, how technologically savvy is the average car shop that works on vehicles? Because what you guys have built looks really cool. And I think we're going to do a demo here in a minute. But to me, I'm just curious how it translates to folks who are, you know, with a wrench in their hand and a socket in the other. So I get that question a lot. And I think that, you know, the uh, it is an industry that I think it's more with 
on the shop owners um, side of things that's more resistant to change. Um, for the technicians, oh, yeah. they're actually pretty tech savvy and it's sort of in the name of the of the job where they learn a lot of different tools they have to keep up with you know different things for different vehicles and and you know like a lot of them are gen z they're like much you know they they you know adopt technology they are tiktoking right they're like so they're used to like you know all of these um latest technologies and and if there just hasn't been a great tool and application that's been built for them and that's what we were really excited about so you know how i got into car repair to answer your previous question you know i met my co-founder uh dave he is a 20 year experience in auto repair industry you know working as a ase master technician so for like mm-hmm. highest rank of being a being a technician and shop owner so knows every pain point in the industry so as we got together to kind of talk about what's possible with AI. It just really felt like the perfect application of AI. And, you know, and we're really going to do it in a way that works on the ground in these shops. And uh, we're seeing the, the adoption, which is which is really amazing. Like our engagement is going up week over week. It is being used on the ground in these shops by the technicians. So it is pretty cool to see. But uh, if we to explain what Master Tech does, I was going just through all your materials and I'm going to attempt a summary here. Essentially, if you are a technician working at a car that comes in, there are so many manufacturers, cars, models, different models, different years, different issues that can come up, different technologies. And so what if you had a place you could go and ask questions and the piece of software using AI, I presume, could fetch the information you need and then present it to you. So that way, no matter what vehicle comes into your shop, you know what's wrong and then how to fix it. How is that? Yeah, I think that's a really good summary. Um, So for the job, for these technicians and mechanics on the ground, the job is really two parts, right? It is one, navigating all of this digital information and technical specification for the vehicles. Um, And then second is the hands-on job that they're they're performing like wrenching and you know replacing components yeah. and re- replacements etc. So you know when we talk to the shop owners, they say that on average 25% of their technicians' time is actually spent doing computer research because every really? single yeah every single vehicle has a different set of specifications, procedures, issues, and it's a lot of um, just navigating through all of that data to be able to know like what to do on the on the vehicle and you have to be very precise if you like put in the wrong amount of fluids you know for a specific engine that could cause a ton of damage so you know so it's kind of the analogy like we like to make is like master tech is sort of like analogous to healthcare right for <clears throat> for people where there's a lot of AI investments in healthcare right now, helping to, you know, coalesce patient history, diagnostics for, for doctors and, you know, all of this data, like reading the test results, et cetera. Um, so we're doing that for vehicles, but unlike, uh, Unlike uh, humans, like uh, actually each vehicle comes with a blueprint for, you know, all of its specifications. So, you know, like for you for or I, it's like we don't come with like, OK, here's all the parts and here's all the numbers. And here's like, you know what, you know, that's something unique for for this human. Right. Whereas this is all the information they have to work with on on cars. And uh, so it is about bringing that together. Um, so in terms of the data that we are yes, sort of. That's where I wanted to go with this because I, I was so curious where you guys got all the information because I presume it's it's you know everywhere in old books that are in glove compartments and old databases and manufacturing stuff that you can't get your hands on. So tell me about how you got all the data, not only ingested, but correct. Yeah. So the data is like extremely important um, to get it right. So this is something that we were very conscious of from day one because, you know, with AI, there's always concerns about trustworthiness, about accuracy. So um, we knew at the start that we did not actually want to train a custom model where, um, you know, this data is sort of baked into it because at the end of the day, all like LLMs and ML models, it is still a probabilistic answer. And for a lot of these specifications and things, you never want to give an answer that's like probably right, you know, like it has to be right or not right so so you know we uh we made sure to you know get our data from the sort of the only real sources of licensed uh oem data providers so they 
um, license out the data on behalf of the OEMs, but we still have to get approval for our use case with each of the OEMs. And that's been like an ongoing process we've been going through for the past year. But we have majority of the approvals that we need, where all of this data is directly from the from the OEMs for the procedures, specifications, and um, everything else. Um, and we're using AI to navigate the user's intent to um, okay. and then serving, ser- pulling the, the correct data and then serving it to them in the way that can best assist them. So does the AI component of this allow a, a technician to essentially ask questions and then it parses that, turns it into a query and then goes to the database of information that you have from OEMs and then grabs the right bits and then brings it up to them? Yeah, yeah. Um, something like that. We do have some, you know, kind of like just in time vectorization of the data. So okay. it allows for semantic search and mm-hmm. not just like sort of a keyword search for the OEM databases. So um, try to, you know, be um, yeah as friendly as possible, you know, um, which which these technicians are are not used to. They're used to like very strict like file folder lookup for these documents or very strict like keyword searches for full documents. Um, so now it's really about having a conversation, finding answers, but every answer is backed up by the source and it's with the original manufacturer copy as well. So going back to the OEM data point, um, you said you have to get agreements with or permission from the OEMs themselves. And you said you had the majority of them. Um, do you guys need to have all of them or is there a certain like critical mass of, okay, cool. We have 80% of the OEMs out there for cars. So now we have enough that we can take this out to you know, the average auto shop and sell it to them? Yeah. So, you know, like it really depends on the shop, but, um, you know, we we are able um, to have enough value with all of the uh, OEMs we have right now and really only missing, you know, two major ones with Honda and Toyota. Um, and those are big manufacturers. Um, I, I think Honda might be, might be pretty close um, um, that we're working with, but um, they're actually a smaller volume for our, our our primary customers, which is the repair shops, because they are sturdier cars. So it's like it is a little bit of like, OK, you know, it's it's actually like it's actually fine. Like it is a smaller volume for a lot of our shops and a lot of our shops are like they spe- specialize in European vehicles or right. something like I, that. I'm so, sure there, there's a BMW specific place. If you have BMW information, you're good to go. But can I just say how hilarious it is that you see f- <laughs> Fewer Honda and Toyota cars because they work. I mean, that's really funny. Uh, but those are both Japanese car companies. And Subaru is as well. Has Subaru come to terms with Master Yeah. Yes. Okay, so no. it's, not, it's not a Japan problem. It's not like those, there's not like export rules from the Japanese economy that disallow this sort of thing. No, no. So we just, um, we, we have to get approvals from each OEM separately. And uh, aside from Honda and Toyota, we have basically everyone else that, that we need. And um, yeah, we're really hopeful that, you know, Honda and Toyota, like we're seeing some traction with, with our progress with the approval process, um, data compliance and et cetera. But it has, has been a process. But yeah, so that's like kind of the first set of data that we're focusing on is OEM data, which is really critical in these shops. Like I said, you know, the, it, it is a pretty critical part of the job to get all of this information before like doing the actual procedure on the yeah. vehicle. Um, but the other two major sets of data we're focusing on is, you know, one, the community data. So, you know, like if you're a technician, right, like and you're, you know, going from apprentice level to, you know, master technician level, um, it is really about like, yes, getting all of the OEM you know, kind of procedures and specifications and knowing how to understand that correctly. But two, it is a lot of personal experience, right? Of like, hey, you know, I have, this is a person that's worked 20 years on Subarus and knows everything about them, all the ticks and all of the, you know, quirks and issues that's for the set of vehicles. Um, so there's a huge component of the job where it is relying on that kind of human experience and community data. And right now, you know, there are some places where there's forums or, Uh you know, some other like specific places where they go and get this community data. So, but that's really going to be a focus of ours, you know, um, at the end of this year, launching like a, you know, user submission content pipeline and just the vision is really becoming like the stack overflow for automotive repair. Yeah. But I, I was I was just thinking that you know what what would make your service not only uh, very good but also entirely unique and, and um, un uh, uncopyable would be to have 
the technicians that are using it leave notes, information, and breadcrumbs for people coming behind them, because then you'd have the OEM data and the real world data, if you will, at the same time, which would be super powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and that is really the 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 essential parts of the job right now, right? And we just want to build a platform that can, you know, so where you don't have to necessarily spend 30 years like working on one specific vehicle to gain kind of the insights and knowledge that that can be shared across to help everyone else that's working on these vehicles because this is a very hard job it is it is a very mm -hmm. dangerous job as well so auto technicians actually one of the top 15 most dangerous jobs in america and a lot of it is because that you know there's so much pressure in production and not enough like software help or time to even find all of this pre precautions or information and safety and so it is about like you know really you know using ai but you know not really you know our our end product is not going to be artificial intelligence it is going to be sort of helping to accumulate human intelligence right that has all of these experiences that has been built up over the years from from all of these technicians and um, yeah, help to make the job faster, easier, safer for everyone. All right. Squarespace is the place to build beautiful websites. You know that. And you can bring your startup to the world with an amazing design and unbelievable functionality. And you don't need to hire developers or a web shop to do it. And if you do hire a web shop to do it, they're going to charge you an arm and a leg. It's going to be thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. They're going to disappear. They're going to change careers. They're going to ghost you. And then you're going to be left with a total mess and have to start over again. Where well, you can trust Squarespace, who I've trusted for over a decade to maintain and really evolve and grow our web presence every business needs a gorgeous website, startups, schools, banks, projects, books, and you can now do it with AI. Squarespace is always at the cutting edge. They now have a design intelligence tool built into Squarespace. And so it'll get you a custom website built for you. That's gorgeous. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, as I'm prone to say. And we all know that your business needs more than just a great looking site. So they have built in payment technology. So if you build something, you can sell it. If you start racking up all those sales, you're going to need analytics to figure out where it's all coming from. And of course, you want a great domain, so they got you covered there. Even better, you're going to save a little bit of money. And everybody likes to save a little cheddar, and Squarespace is so generous. Squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial when you're ready to launch. You go to Squarespace.com slash twist and you get 10% off your first website or domain purchase. That's Squarespace.com slash twist. We love them here. Longest running partner on This Week in Startups, and we really do appreciate that. So, Linda, I would love to see this in action. It's great to talk about it, but it's a little hard for me to conceive of what it looks like kind of on the ground. So can you uh, give us a quick tour? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and as you do this, Linda, just for people who are on the audio version of this, can you just live sportscast as you go through and explain and detail kind of what you're doing? Yeah, um, sounds good. So, um, yeah, so as you guys can see here, so basically this is the Master Tech AI platform. You can add your vehicle, uh, you know, into the platform that your shop is working on. Um, it is fully mobile optimized. Uh, it's a web application, but we're going to be building a fully native mobile um, application in the future as well. So, you know, voice, vision, you know, the whole gamut for multimodal uh, AI assistance. Um, but once you have your, um, and you can also scan in your vehicle when you're on mobile with a VIN scanner, um, mm -hmm. camera-based VIN scanner as well. Um, but let's say we already have this vehicle added in here for this 2010 Mercedes. Um, so it is a like a AI-first, chat-first interface where you can get any kind of assistance that you need. We do have some quick actions pre-built for some of the more most common actions for performing a procedure, diagnosing issue, looking at specifications, you know, managing labor times, you know, for your shop, um, et cetera. So, um, so let's just say we are diagnosing an issue today and we're um, there's a noise that's on this uh, on this Mercedes that's coming into the shop, and we're just gonna say like, hey, let's do a noise diagnosis and get the kind of assistance that we need on on that. So we're gonna go through. We're gonna pull up this is the OEM uh, procedure for noise diagnosis for this particular model. It actually comes with um, some detailed uh, flowcharts for what to do, which our AI can help you navigate as you um, try these different things, um, and it comes with some of the known issues for um, 
uh, for this model as far as noise issues that has been reported. You know, um, this is to uh, NHTSA, uh, National Highway Transport Safety uh, Administration. And all the OEMs are required to, to you know, report all of the known issues for any model, which mm-hmm. we have fully indexed um, into our system as well. So it basically gives all of this information about how you can approach this generic issue and, you know, give some known issues. But, you know, we did give a pretty generic, you know, kind of ask. So, you know, it, the, the system detects is like, hey, we can actually narrow this down a little bit if you can give me a little bit more information. So when is this noise issue occurring? Is it you know, under certain conditions. So we can say like, hey, it's happening, um, let's say when when the vehicle is um, accelerating, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, you're only putting in uh, like noise issue and wind accelerating. Like you you don't have to give it hyper detailed uh, requests. It's pretty much just giving it a couple of words and then it goes to work for you. That's right. Um, So when we... Um, add in the more specific information, then it's like, hey, based on the fact that it's happening when it's turning, here are some more likely causes of this issue based on all of the available documents. And here are some known issues that's like, hey, there's this one that's been reported that's known for this this engine that, you know, there's this, this noise issue when you're going forward or reverse. And um, so it really kind of helps to narrow down kind of the specifics of what the technicians are looking for. So yeah. today, you know, without this platform, they're going off to all these different sources, database sources to try to find this information and cross correlate. And so it's really about doing it faster, doing it more accurately, more comprehensively. And uh, yeah, it's like, it's kind of what I think technology should be used for is, you know, in really helping productivity in the, in the real world. Um, so can, I, me- can I try a query while, yeah. while we're here? All right. Uh, can we do a 2019 Subaru Outback? Okay. So let's add that vehicle. Um, 2019. So we'll add it by year make model this time instead of VIN. Um, let's say this is the it's submodel. The, it's the V6 version, if that matters. Okay. Well, hopefully this one is, this is still and, good. Yeah. Because we actually do have a minor annoying issue with it. Okay. So... Uh, why won't the passenger window entirely go up? Why does it get stuck halfway up and then make us want to scream? Okay. Let's say, why does passenger window get stuck? Perfect. I, I'm so curious if this is going to work. If this works, Linda, I'm going to jump for joy. Um, so it, it looks like there were actually some known issues, um, that were found, um, so it looks like the most likely issues is a faulty power window switch, uh, mechanical issue with the window regulator. So there was actually like two TSBs that were related to issues with the power window for this model, and as well as a um, a Subaru procedure for how to like reset the the module and and work on it. So um, so this is at least a good starting point for diagnosing this this particular problem. So how has traction been in the market and how much are you guys focused on, on growth today versus kind of still building out the product itself? Yeah. Um, so we actually launched, uh, publicly to shops May 1st. Mm -hmm. So that was only about five, five months ago or, or so. Um, so uh, we've gotten um, so far about 40 shops signed up on monthly subscription. Um, yeah, and uh, we've actually, the, the product has, we've built a lot more data into the product, a lot more features. So, um, you know, with product market fit, it's always an evolving process, but it's been uh, like really amazing actually to see the engagement from our users increase over time. So even the, you know, the users, um, the same set of users are, are coming back to the platform as we add more data, as we add more features, um, and the engagement is growing week over week. That's per user, per shop, in addition to the new shops that are that's signing on. So um, so it is it is really cool to see. Kind of with the AI-based uh, platform, the really nice thing is that we can we know exactly what the users are looking for ah. in, using our system. It's not a guess game of like, hey, why didn't they click on this button or what were they trying to do? Right? You, you can see uh, exactly what the users were looking for and whether we were able to help help them. And that really helps us to prioritize what kind of data we need to get and, and help with next. 
So Linda, I know your uh, your kind of average tier is like 180 bucks a month, uh, 40 shops. You guys are getting close to 100k in ARR, so it seems like there's some good early momentum going. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's been really exciting, and uh, the momentum is has been sort of accelerating as we um, get more data incorporated um, and uh, seeing better signs of product market fit. To now where um, we're getting more customers from word of mouth uh, for some of our shop owners to telling other uh, like face group. Uh, Facebook groups for shop owners and, you know, about our product. So we're getting, you know, more and more of that as we, uh, you know, see more signs of product market fit. We are still incorporating a lot more data, you know, so we have, you know, I think most of the data that the shops need on the ground. So procedures, specifications, uh, fluids, like DTC code, um, diagnosis, help, labor times. We're incorporating like wiring diagrams. We're incorporating like maintenance schedules. Mm -hmm. We're incorporating like the shop management data. So so plugging into um, the solutions they use for record keeping for shop management, um, getting the customer history, navigating the vehicle history, um, et cetera. And then, of course, the community data that's going to be uh, coming coming soon. But uh, yeah, as we're kind of uh, you know growing the product, we are seeing better better engagement, better traction. Uh, we're getting into a lot of these kind of coaching groups for shop owners, and we're going to be present at some trade shows to help our growth as well. So um, that's kind of the plan to, to go forward. All right. So one last question for you, and this one's slightly rude because I, I love what you build. I'm glad you're seeing traction. I, I think it's really cool. But one reason, Linda, why I want to buy an electric car is how simple they are. I don't want to deal with fluids, just like I didn't want to deal with carburetors as a child. So does the advent and kind of growth of EVs make car maintenance so much simpler that it undercuts the future growth potential of Master Tech? Um, we don't think so. So with EVs, um, it does eliminate um, some of the, like, uh, maintenance that's associated with a traditional internal combustion engine uh, vehicle, you know, when it comes to like oil change and, you know, things like that. But actually it, it is adding a lot more complications for um, that the shops today, most of them are not really equipped to fully um, uh, transition and, and adopt to. So kind of with the rise of EVs and also with hybrids as well. So hybrids are even more complicated because you oh, have... Yeah both sets of systems to service at one time. Um, but we really see a huge potential, right, to um, with with our platform, since we're already embedded in, you know, a lot of these shops to help them with the transition to servicing EVs, to servicing hybrids. Um, so, you know, Tesla is, is doing a really great job of hash, actually having their service data information open versus um, some of the more traditional like OEM ma manufacturers. So being able to have a way to access kind of their service data or, you know, even some of the onboard uh, uh, onboard like diagnostics and things like that remotely. So it's actually really great. And they're, they're very like, you know, kind of opening the way to, to, to like how things could be, could be done in the, in the future. Um, so we're really looking to kind of leverage that into, in the future as well. All right. Well, listen, when it hits a quarter million ARR, give me a call. I'll have you back on and hear how things are going, but Linda, I really appreciate it. And Godspeed on the go-to-market motion. And in the meantime, where can people find you and the company online? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, so you can find us at mastertech.ai. Yeah, we're we're just getting started, but we're really excited for the future. You know, um, and and speaking of the future, um, this is really something where kind of we're starting in the auto vertical, but you know, kind of what what we're building, we can we see it easily translating to other uh, verticals, um, as well. So, you know, we've, we've talked to like HVAC companies that's like, gosh, please build something like this for our industry because our, the service information we have to work with is even worse than with, uh, in, in auto. So, so, you know, with something like Master Tech, we really envision a future where like, hey, let's say you can scan the serial number for your HVAC unit or any uh -huh. kind of like cars, boats, like machinery, and get all of the the you know service information that you need, like the blueprints, the the wiring diagrams to help the technicians on the ground. And it's something with AI, with AR, you know, voice. Um, it's so that's that's really like kind of the future vision. Yeah. I we, there's so much more we could have talked about. I had a whole augmented reality segment that I didn't get to because I talked too much earlier on. But I can also imagine 
solar panel installer groups would like to have this to help troubleshoot different things. Um, wind power, batteries for both grids and for the home, pretty much anything that requires a lot of maintenance and has a high value. I can see it being a master tech vertical in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's not a small idea at all. And uh, you better go get back to work, but thank you for coming <laughs> on and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I talk about prediction markets all the time on my podcast and prediction markets are brilliant because they allow people to buy and sell contracts on future events with prices set by market opinion. So if you're interested in this, we've got some amazing news. Halshi, the world's largest prediction market, just made it legal to trade on the upcoming U.S. elections. That's right. For the first time in 100 years, U.S. citizens can now legally place trades on election outcomes. Political polls can certainly be inaccurate. We've learned that. But the markets tell you where the sharps are putting their money. Sharps are the smart people. And election outcomes matter. They impact your taxes, the economy, and of course, the world of investing. Traditionally, only large corporations and the wealthy could hedge their bets against election uncertainties. But now, Calshi allows anyone to protect themselves if their preferred candidate loses. So go check out the real-time election odds. And if you feel confident about who's going to win, why not play some trade? I'm going to do it. So here's your call to action. I want you to check out Calshi. That's Calshi.com slash twist. K-A-L-S-H-I. Calshi.com slash twist and get in on the action. You will get an additional $20 with your first deposit of 100. That's Kalshi.com slash twist. We have an interview coming to you right now with one of the coolest companies in the world of startups. I have tracked this company for a very long time through its series A, through its series C, through its series D. It's been a long time coming. The company is Monte Carlo. Now, with generative AI making data even more valuable than before, it's the right time to talk to the company because they are a key name in the data observability movement, and that means they are right in the spotlight today. Please welcome to the show, it's CTO and co-founder, Lior Gauche. Lior, hey. Hey, Alex. Good to be here again. Good to see you, man. So first of all, I was prepping for our chat today, going back through the stuff I've written about your company, the space. And I literally just did a search for data observability. And one thing that, that hit me was how popular that term is now. There were so many companies that were advertising against it and trying to grab essentially attention from it. But if I recall correctly, Monte Carlo actually coined that term a few years back. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we we kind of, we were the pioneers with using that terminology and, um, I can't claim credit to the name observability. We were kind of uh, borrowing it from DevOps and from software engineering, uh, but it kind of applying it to a new to to what was then a, a new space for it, which is uh, data and analytics and ML. Um, and and that's kind of where we started from. When we started when we first researched uh, before we even started the company. We figured that data teams kind of struggle with the same sort of struggles that software engineers struggle, which is making sure their stuff works reliably and that they're delivering high quality products to their end users. But, you know, whereas observability existed for a while in, in applications and infrastructure, data engineers really had no tooling and I dare say even like no serious methodology to deal with, with managing reliability and quality. And, and we thought there was an opportunity to help them to build both um, the ops process, if you will, and, and the technology to support it. And so, and, and we borrowed the terminology too. We called it data observability. Yeah. Uh, and we built the equivalent of, you know, a data dog or a new relic uh, for people that build data systems. So back when I first spoke to uh, Bar Moses, your co-founder, she had explained the term to me. She had explained why it matters in the market. And, you know, this was back in probably 2020 or so. And now, of course, so many people are piling into the space. Does that end up being a net positive for Monte Carlo that so many people want to get a bite of the apple? Because it implies lots of attention and so forth, but also more competition. So how does that net out for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we consider it a, 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 a big positive for us. Um, you know, five, I think it's probably five years after I uh, started a company after we first spoke and proud to serve over 400 enterprises today. Uh, we have customers in every industry, tech, pharma, finance, manufacturing, sports, education, you name it. We, 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 we serve companies in the space, so people are doing interesting things with data in, in pretty much every domain, and we're, we're proud to, to help them 
uh, you know, make it make it high quality and high reliability. And, and it's just natural when there's demand and when there's a, a real pain and a real need, a lot of a lot of people are going to try to solve it. And 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 from our perspective, we we love competition. It you know it it, it does make us better. Uh, we, we, I don't think we have a monopoly on all the good ideas. The competition does make us better, and 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 it also, I think, signals to customers that that the category is important, uh, that yeah. there's real interest in it, and that they should be evaluating solutions. And so, I'm going to say it's net net positive. And and l- luckily enough, we we win most of our big costs of the competition, so and we're not feeling the negatives too much so far, but. I no. was going to ask, you know, are you crushing Splunk? Are you crushing IBM, Excel Data, MetaPlay, and Strong Team? All the companies that are talking about this online. And so it sounds like the answer is yes. But I want to go back to what you said about industries. That's a beautiful segue to where I wanted to go. Because when I think about uh, the earlier days of Monte Carlo, like I said, Barr had explained to me what it was. And so I presume the industry, the tech industry, was coming to grips with the idea. But I think based on what you just said about pharmaceuticals and so forth, that the idea has clearly broken out of the tech space and is now well-known out there in the broader world of business. So I'm curious, was there a moment when you noticed that data obs as a concept had, you know, escaped the uh, cage and left tech and gone out into the world? Yeah, I was really surprised with that. Uh, you know, in the early days, when we talked about it, uh, nobody, I think, really knew what we were talking about. Uh, in, in fact, even data observability didn't click right in. I think what the, the language that actually kind of piques everybody's interest with, with data downtime, which is the problem that we solve, right? It's this idea that if you're building the data and you're serving the wrong data to your, you know, to your end users, that's downtime, you know, in the same way that the folks at Gmail uh, don't want you to try to load your inbox and get, you know, a 404. Uh, data people don't want you to load your dashboard uh, or use your model and get the wrong results, right? And so, Kind of using that terminology, data downtime resonated from the get go, and I think over the past few years we've been able to also educate people about the, the solution to data downtime. Right, data downtime is the problem. Data observability is um, is, is one solution to that problem. And um, and 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 you know, by I, I don't know if there was if there was a single moment that I recall, but. You know, at, at this point, uh, yeah, most data professionals I talk to have heard the term and know what it means. Uh, Gartner has picked up the terminology and is hey, the show market guides and all kinds of things. Um, so that's that's pretty exciting. And 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 and, and yeah, you know, this is probably from the last twelve months or so. Uh, we're seeing more and more enterprises, um, you know, putting out RFPs for for data observability. Are like, oh, cool. You, you know what it is and you want one. Okay, yeah. got it. We have one. <laughs> well, welcome to the party. You're all yeah. you're all very, very welcome. Um, so on the point of data downtime, the way that I understand Monte Carlo is that it kind of keeps tabs on data that's flowing through your various pipes as a company and can spot anomalies. So for example, if a data point comes in at a zero when it's never been zeroed out, probably something's broken upstream. How much ML, I guess what we now call AI, is applied to that process of, of seeing kind of like anomalies and other issues as they happen? Quite a bit. Uh, so one of the key innovations in the space uh, that, that that we brought on and that later many other companies about too, was this idea that, hey, if you're a data engineer or data analyst, you can't be expected to track every single table, every single field you have in your databases and data warehouses mm-hmm. and really uh, deeply understand how it behaves and, and what it means for it to be broken. And so we have to use uh, some form of, of ML and, and now AI to, um, to help basically to scale the thing, right? To allow you know, a, a small group of people that build the thing to actually monitor a lot of data. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of machine learning that goes into anomaly detection, right? Basically looking at past patterns of the data, predicting what it should be, and then, you know, being able to alert when it breaks from that pattern. Uh, but also, there's also other use cases of, of AI and ML there. It's, uh, we can also use AI techniques to analyze not, not just the data, but also the metadata around it, like descriptions that the humans have created around it, or logs of how the data has been used or analyzed in the past, 
that really help inform how to spot breakages and issues. We can use AI, we do, uh, to help people get to root causes quicker, right? To find out what happened and why it happened and where, where the problems originating from, because these data pipelines are increasingly more and more complex. Yeah. Uh, so lots of applications of ML and AI and, and data visibility. Yeah. So I was thinking that's what I thought you were going to say. And so my question is very simple. You know, since you founded the company, we have entered into a new AI wave, AI boom, if you will. And I knew you guys were using AI to actually power the engine of the product. And so I'm curious, uh, Lior, why haven't you raised, I don't know, $6 billion at a $100 billion valuation? Oh, good. Uh, well, we've covered our, our uh, some of our rounds. We've been very well capitalized. And um, and so on, honestly, we just didn't need to, uh, in a sense. I think the exciting thing about, about Monte Carlo right now, more than the use of AI within our product, which which has benefited our, our customers quite a bit, I think the, the even more exciting thing for me is the fact that we're able to help our customers build AI, yeah. right? Because, you know, the, 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 the models, today, I, I think it's kind of weird to say, but all these models are quite incredible and they're also a commodity. Literally yeah. every company in the world has access to the most incredible models ever built. Um, it's as easy as creating an API key with, with OpenAI or Anthropic or, or what have you. And, and so the real differentiator is the data, right? The data that companies are able to, uh, to, to basically inject into their, into these models. And that's where we fit in, right? Like companies are building pipelines that basically power AI applications, uh, or to analyze unstructured data. And get, and guess what? Like these pipelines break, like any other pipeline, and and and, and our customers are using Monte Carlo to to monitor and alert and, and prevent downtime in those pipelines, and so that's probably one of the most exciting things that happened to us over the past five years. And yeah. Well, with the concept of data downtime, it gets really hilarious if you have a a AI model ingesting your data and then using that to talk to customers because you might say like, "When is my flight going to come?" And then United looks at its database, there's a zero, and it goes, "What flight? Screw you!" And then the customer freaks out. So it, it does really matter. But a beautiful segue because prepping for our chat today, I was just going back through Monte Carlo's site, which I have seen, you know, over the years. And you guys are like, we're the AI and data observability company. And I was like, wow, that's a big, I didn't expect to see so much AI, but then I got thinking about it. And I think you're pretty much right that people want to build more stuff, want to use more AI, have to have the data right. So my question is for, for Monte Carlo, how much of an accelerant has the moment been of people wanting to build AI and therefore paying more attention to their data? Has it been noticeable to your growth rate, to new customer acquisition? Close to 100% of our customers ask us about AI use cases while considering solutions because wow. they are either building them right now or are planning to build and invest. And they want to make sure that their data durability provider is going to to support that. Uh, we get asked a lot about unstructured data and how we can help monitor unstructured data. Um, you know, it started, like, I, I don't know, up until a year or two ago, uh, we pretty much only did structured data because that's what people were doing with data. That's the only thing that was access essentially accessible uh, unless you had an army of PhDs that can build custom NLP and, and vision models. Uh, and now again, it's a commodity. Everybody can analyze unstructured data. And we've seen some really cool use cases of that. And, so, and, and customers are wanting us to, to help uh, make sure these pipelines are working great. So and I can't A-B test. I can't tell you what, what our growth rate would have been without generative AI coming. But I can certainly say it's, it's, been, a, it's been a booster to our, you know, to our uh, business outcomes for sure. So when you talk about structured data and unstructured data, I'm thinking you know, data lakes, data warehouses, data lake houses, data bricks. Uh, has Databricks tried to buy you guys? Databricks? Yeah. Uh, it's like you would nest really neatly in right there. I hope the answer is no, but I'm just curious now that you brought up unstructured data. No, we are friends with Databricks. <laughs> you know, we, we, we talk regularly with, with, with their teams, uh, but we're good partners. We, work, we have a lot of mutual customers, but we have never wanted to sell the company and they've never... No, the answer is no. Good, good. Well, I'm actually, I'm very glad to hear that because it would be a disappointment if after all the work you guys have done, you exited before an IPO. I'm, I'm literally going to hold you guys to going public at some point in time in the future. So I do want to talk about the business a little bit because uh, you and I spoke back in, um, I think it was around May of 2022. You guys raised mm -hmm. your Series D, 135 million, $1.6 billion valuation. And, uh, you know, 
I knew at the time you guys were coming off of an incredible period of growth. At the time of your preceding round, you had doubled your ARR in each of the last four quarters. Now that's mm-hmm. a little bit back in the past, a smaller company, but still a good data point. But at the time when you raised that last round, you told me that you were going to invest across the board and you were going to invest in uh, engineering data product and go to market work in the near future. Right after we talked, the world changed. And suddenly everyone was like, don't spend money, don't burn, maybe pare back your growth rate. And so I'm curious, you and I spoke right before the the winds changed, if you will. So um, how did the kind of lived reality of Monte Carlo uh, come to be after that moment and did it match your earlier expectations? Yeah, great question. You know, fun fact, I think we closed our Series D literally the week before the world changed or something like that. So it's, uh, it, it literally happened at the same time. I, I don't think it changed much in the sense that I'm, I'm happy you want, us, you want to hold us accountable to going public because that's exactly what we set out to do from the day we built the company. We never... We always had to, the intention to build a, you know, a long lasting business. Yeah. Uh, we may fail at it, but that's what we wanted to do. And so from our perspective, you know, from day one, we knew we were going to go through multiple economic cycles, especially if we're successful, right? If we fail, we fail. But if we're successful, the company is going to run for, you know, 10 years and more. And in, in, in that time, they're, going, they're just going to be good economic times, bad economic times. And so we never spend the money that we had we always think about the business and what the business needs and how do we get as many customers as we can make them as happy as we can while keeping uh you know the costs and and unit economics uh within reason for our stage and so honestly it didn't change our plans much because we always kind of had the intention of spending responsibly now over five years of course there were times where we made mistakes both directions like sometimes we overhired sometimes we underhired and you know, that happens because, you know, we're humans, but uh, how dare you, sir? our philosophy. You know, earlier we were talking about generative AI, people wanting to have their data prepared and so forth. I presume people are, are, are pushing more and more data through Monte Carlo's vision, if you will. And I'm just curious, are, are there economies of scale still at the business that are helping you guys in terms of gross margin and unit economics? Or has that stabilized? by this point in the company's uh, trajectory? There are certainly economies of scale and, you know, we make it a point to, uh, we, we start out pretty early in our, as part of trying being, to be responsible with cost. We've been trying to basically be on, a, on an improving trend uh, of, of gross margin. So we, we, we keep improving it every year. You know, it's part economies of scale. It's part, uh, you know, active efforts. You know, for example, we can, and we do optimize our infrastructure spend as, as we grow and, and optimize our, our, our code. Overall, seeing a positive trend uh, as we scale. So I also saw that you guys, according to your very own LinkedIn page, Lior, uh, recently hired your first chief revenue officer. I'm kind of curious for a company of Monte Carlo scale, you know, five, six years old, Series D, is that kind of like a baby CFO or is that really just a revenue generating focus? It's a great question. We feel it's, or for us, it's basically a, a, a scaling play, right? Like I think the team that's been there for the first five years are people that are really, really strong at, you know, cracking the playbook, if you will, figuring out how to how to do it one. And we, we are at a point where we need to get more consistency in a larger team and kind of execute across, you know, execute the playbook that we learned across, you know, across the board. And and, and that's why we thought it was time to bring in, you know, a, a responsible adult, if you will, that, that will, will take us in that direction. And, and you know, Tim's done it before in a number of companies, most recently at Stack Overflow, where he oh. kind of made Stack Overflow a, a journey of AI uh, business. And, and we're very excited about what he brings to the table in terms of, you know, scaling playbooks, if you will, uh, across larger teams. You, you can't you can't tell me you hired a guy named Tim to be part of the finance team, to be the adult in the room and have it not be a baby CFO. I call BS. Okay. That's, that's exactly what everyone says when they hire a CFO. Now we have to do our expenses within 60 days, not 90. It's terrible. <laughs> okay, so, so Lior, I put you guys on the Twist 500, which is our, uh, it's 105, 106 companies now. It's our, it's our list we're building out of the companies we think are going to have the biggest financial outcomes, which is a proxy for innovation, market disruption, and so forth. Startups to watch is kind of the basics of it. And I think you guys clearly fit that bill. But you said something earlier on that I want to close with. You said, you know, we could fail. Mm -hmm. To me, 
you know, Monte Carlo at at its age, and if I kind of make up some numbers and put them through your historical growth rates, it's a pretty serious business now. You guys have access to lots of capital. How, what what do you mean if we fail? What does that mean? I've been doing startups long enough to know that that you know things can always go wrong. I, I think the word "fail" perhaps is uh, compared to our grand ambitions, right? Like we want to build you know an independent business that would eventually go public and then way beyond that, right? Yeah. Um, want to build the you know the best company of the decade if we can. And that's really hard. That's really really hard, and 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 the odds are you know not in your favor as a founder, right? Like there's more. There's always more chances of failing than, than succeeding in those kind of things. And the business is is growing, it's humming, it's growing. I don't think it's going away. I think customers are, you know, there's a real pain and there's a real need and 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 we're there to serve it. And so in, in that regard, I don't think we're going away anytime soon. But you know, we, we're shooting for the highest outcomes that we possibly can. Aspirations are good. I never like the phrase, you know, um, shoot for the stars and maybe you'll hit the moon or maybe it's the other way around, but I think that applies here. Keep going for it. I'm all about it. And as, as a last thing, we talk a lot about how you can make a lot of money selling picks and shovels during a gold rush. And I think we're currently in an AI gold rush. But in the case of Monte Carlo, you guys actually started your picks and shovels business before people knew there was gold. So I got to say, well done, man. Uh, Lior, thank you for coming on the show. We'll have you back on next year to see how things are going. But in the meantime, it's uh, MonteCarloData.com. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Alex, for having me. So fun. Thank you. See you soon. I have to care.